Good evening, my name is Cordy Qualley and I'm here with Laura Ramos and by the uh, power of video, uh, Mike Sherry's to talk to you about water availability, economic impacts and solutions to water and uh, agriculture in the San Joaquin Valley. As I said, I'm Cordy Qualley, I'm with Elias College of Engineering. Laura Ramos is here tonight with me. She's the Associate Director of the California Water Institute. And then Michael uh, with the uh, Pepperdine University will be sharing with you via video presentation. Our tonight, what we're going to talk about is I'm going to introduce to you the wicked water problems in the San Joaquin Valley. Michael is going to illustrate how those wicked water problems uh, impact our economics. And then Laura is going to finish up with a discussion on the solutions that we have been working on towards these wicked water problems. Starting out, wicked water problem number one is our changing hydrology. Some of you may remember from your basic science the hydrologic cycle. Cycle Well, in California, our water starts in the Pacific Ocean, travels over the valley, impact, uh, impinges on the Sierra Nevada, which uh, creates rainfall both in the valley and in snowfall in the mountains. That, uh, those two types of precipitation result in a runoff that replenishes our groundwater basins and fills our reservoirs. But one of the interesting things about California is we are so unique about everything that we do that we have to have an incredibly diverse climate. In the north part of the valley, up around uh, north of Sacramento, we get about 60 inches of rain per year, precipitation per year. Down here in the San Joaquin Valley, we get about 10 inches. That's a huge disparity, and that will come into play later as we talk. Um, climate change has affected the cycle. So in the past, our precipitation has, has varied from year to year, but it has stayed somewhat close to that mean, and that has allowed us to design a predictable runoff volume for our reservoirs to store. However, due to the warming, warming of the climate change, our precipitation averages have changed, shifted dramatically. And now we see we have punctuated uh, wet periods with longer periods of extreme dry. And that has changed uh, the way we understand how runoff is going to occur and changed our volume pictures, which is creating havoc in our ability to manage water. Just as sort of an illustration, the last drought period we had, 2014 through 16, we were averaging about 49% of our average precipitation across the state. Followed in 2017 by one of the, by the wettest year on record where we had six inches more than our previous record year of 82 and 83. So you can see that we are swinging dramatically between these two. Um, interestingly enough, our average precipitation has stayed about the same, it's just that it arrives in these great extremes. Uh, our water uses, a uh, wicked water problem number two is that we have three straws today. We have agriculture, we have uh, urban uses, and the environment. In a year where we have plenty of water, you can see that the split is about like this, 62% uh, environment, 29% water, and, ag and urban showing up at about 8%. When we run into a, a drier years, agriculture of the available water now switches over and we're seeing 60, over 60% 60 going to agriculture. Environment is, is diminishing to 28% and 11% increase is a slight increase in urban uses. The reason for this swing is the fact that we have less water available for our riverine systems when we don't have, when we're in a dry situation. Down here at the lower, uh, you can see how the uh, water uh, it gets uh, parsed between the environment agriculture and urban in the San Joaquin and Tulare Lake basins. And you can see that agriculture is still the predominant use of water in these regions. Um, water, our water sources, primarily our go-to sources for water in the Central Valley and San Joaquin area is um, groundwater, our surface water and groundwater. And we are a conjunctive use state, meaning that we depend on both. So surface water is like our checking account. We use it as long as it's available. And then when we run out of money at the end of the month, we go to our savings account. And that's what we do when we run out of a surface water. We go to groundwater. And that is, uh, provides us with that cushion so that we can continue to have our economies uh, prosper in those dry periods. We also have some, in California, we use a little bit of desal uh, for water source. And hopefully, in the near future, we'll be able to use direct potable reuse but these are coming online. Uh, one of the things I need to point out to you as we uh, focus on the use of groundwater to in these, particularly these dry periods that we've been experiencing, uh, we see a decline in groundwater levels. 
The orange line is the San Sacramento Valley, where you can see where they have much more precip. The groundwater table is not affected as much. As you move south to the drier areas, particularly in the Tulare Basin area, you see this very steep decline in groundwater levels. Um, and that's, that's what we need to be pay attention to. Well, what does groundwater depletion do? What happens when those groundwater tables drop? We see six negative impacts. Subsidence, which is pictured up over here with this famous picture of Dr. Pollard in, in near Mendota where we've seen about 30 feet of drop or 25 feet of drop in 50 years of land actually literally dropping in elevation. Uh, we see a decline in water quality in the groundwater, uh, negative impacts on river flows because the rivers are now feeding the groundwater table instead of being fed by them. Uh, domestic farm wells are going dry because that groundwater level is dropping below where the wells are. Increased pumping costs and also in the coast seawater intrusion. So in 2014, the California legislature, recognizing that these impacts were not good for us, uh, passed the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, where they created GSAs, uh, groundwater sustainability agencies, who were to put together groundwater, uh, I'm sorry, uh, groundwater sustainability plans. These plans have embedded in them policies and uh, projects that are supposed to work towards the stabilization of that groundwater table. Um, but we know that the enactment of Sigma will have some severe impacts on our agriculture use and which will also impact our, our economy and here in the valley. We're, we have made estimates up to one million acres of active farmland will be, have to be followed in order to balance our groundwater use. And that will have an estimated nine, million, nine billion dollar impact on our economy out of around a $36, $36 billion uh, industry. So this, the fourth wicked water problem is our aging infrastructure. Some of you may be aware of how this all works, but we have two major, three major arteries of, of water supply in the, in the San Joaquin Valley area, which is right here. This is Fresno. Uh, the Central Valley Project, which brings water from Shasta down through the Sacramento River through the Delta and then in, through the uh, Delta Mendota Canal here on the south side of the Delta down to the Mendota Pool, which distributes water for ag use in the uh, west side of the valley. The, also, the Central Valley Project is, consists of the Friant Kern Canal, which starts at, in uh, Friant, takes San Joaquin River down the east side of the valley, distributes it to water contractors for agricultural use, and also brings water into the, to the Kern uh, County area. The third source is the State Water Project, which brings water from Oroville down through the Delta and then down through the, the California Aqueduct, which provides water to the west side of the valley and primarily to Southern California and the South Coast. Um, this infrastructure was constructed between the 1930s and the 70s. It was based on our old hydrology. We are now in a very uh, shifting environment, hydrologically speaking, and it's become uh, not as much as an asset. And so um, we're going to move forward now. Um, Mike is going to share with you a, uh, his uh, study that he did for Westlands Water District on uh, the economic impacts of, do this one more time. Hi, this is Mike Shires, and I'm excited to be sharing with you the results of our, economic, our analysis of the economic impact of the Westlands Water District. The Westlands Water District is located on the western side of the Central Valley, and receives its water largely from the, under contract from the Central Valley Project. It's located in Fresno and Kings counties. So in our analysis, we looked at the 2019 crop year, which at the time was the most recent year for which we had complete data. In 2019, Westlands growers had roughly 400,000 acres in pro agricultural production, and the economic value of that production was estimated at $1.95 billion. Now this roughly $2 billion of economic of agricultural production resulted in about $5 billion, $4.7 billion in economic activity in the region. And it accounted for more than 35,000 jobs. Now these 35,000 jobs are important because these are jobs that are happening in one of the poorest regions of the state. If we look at and compare Fresno and Kings counties to the state overall, for example, in this measure of poverty, the share of families below the poverty level, we can see some stark differences. California statewide averaged about 8% of families below the poverty level in 2019. Kings County was at about 13% and Fresno was more than twice the state average at seven, roughly 17%. 
If we want to look at median household income, the statewide median in household income is about $80,000. In Fresno and Kings, the median is less than $60,000. If we look at unemployment rates, in March of this year, the statewide average was about 4% unemployment. In Fresno and Kings County, it's 8%. So the jobs that are happening in this region are happening in an area where there's high poverty. And we also noticed something else about these trends. The patterns look familiar. And so if you compare these trends in poverty to the, to the years when the district, when the water district received less water, you see an association, you see a correlation between the trends. These bars represent how much water the district did not receive in each year. And the correspondence is remarkable. We couldn't, obviously there's not enough data points for statistical significance, but the trends are really informative. Also, when water is less available, we see more following of acreage. In other words, when there's less water, they don't plant as many crops. And in this chart, you can see that documented. The blue line is how much they receive and the brown line is the number of acres that uh, were followed in those years. And you see kind of the inverse relationship between the two. Um, if we look at what the, so we wanted to look at what the impact of following is. In 2019, the district received 75% of its allocation. So that 25% of water that it didn't receive accounted for about 8,000 jobs by our estimates and almost 20%, uh, almost a billion dollars of economic activity, very significant impacts. Now, in the past, when we've had less surface water, we've done a few things. The first thing is we've tried to be more efficient in how we use the water we do have, uh, whether that's, you know, uh, drip irrigation or whether that's changing the kind of crop mix or whatever you have. Um, the second thing we've done, and, and this is you know, widely known, is that when we don't have surface water, we increase our groundwater pumping. So if we look at this chart to the right, the yellow and light blue areas are surface water. And in years when those numbers are really low, we see the dark blue number, the groundwater pumping increase dramatically. Uh, and then finally, as a nation, when we aren't producing crops in the Central Valley, Central Valley produces uh, the vast majority of fresh fruit and produce that you find in supermarkets in the United States. But when that happens, um, we import more food from other places. We've heard conversations in the past few weeks about some of those imports getting stuck at the border. So, if we think about these things that we've done in the past in terms of efficiencies, efficiencies have limits. I mean, you can only you can only put in drip irrigation across your entire area. After you've done that, there's not a lot more efficiency to be gained. In terms of groundwater, uh, we have put in place a plan to try and manage the underground underground aquifers, um, and that plan will actually require limits. Those dark blue areas we saw in that chart are going to be much smaller because of that. We're not going to be able to offset it, which means we're going to be able, we're going to be forced to have less acreage in production, uh, which means fewer fresh crops and fresh fruit and produce. And then finally, what we've seen recently is the supply chain is not as reliable and transparent and easy as we thought. And in fact, those recent um, disruptions are expected to last for some time. So what does this mean for us all? Well, first, we have to act today. I mean, our food supply is more vulnerable than it ever has been. If you add these, th these three things that we just talked about together, we could actually see significant reductions in domestic fresh fruit and produce production in the United States. Uh, one of the lessons of COVID was we shouldn't be dependent on foreign sources for our critical items, uh, things like PPE and pharmaceuticals. Well, food and water are also critical items. And so we need to come up with ways of having reliable supplies of, of both. Um, to do things, we must invest today. It's going to take time to put things in place, whether it's building gray water recycling in urban areas, um, whether it's you know, modifying farming processes and water transfer across the state, <clears throat> or whether it's the creation of more surface or underground storage, things like uh, aquifer replenishment strategies. All of these require investments and take time to put into place. I think also in the long run, we have to be looking at the supply side of this and looking for new ways to bring water supplies to the state, whether that's desalination, especially in coastal urban areas, uh, the transport of other water from other places in the country. I mean, we do move oil and gas around the country. Uh, there's some engineering and environmental issues to deal with, but we could move, um, we could move water. Bottom line is all of these things take time to do and we need to start acting and investing today. Thank you for the time. So we thank um, Mike Shires for sending that over and he apologizes for not being able to be here today. Um, and so I will talk to you a little bit more about solutions. 
um, but I forgot to add one slide. One of the solutions that I have is that the Craig host is more water talks or more talks like today because then it rains. Yeah. <laughs> right? um, so, um, one of the, uh, the other solutions, so as Cordy mentioned, he mentioned three, three straws, and I'm going to move it into four uh, because I'm going to split one of them into two. So he talked about urban, and urban, I'm going to divide it into um, rural residential and then urban residential. And um, so the demand and the supply for water it is very much in balance right now. The demand is high for everything, for agriculture, for the environment, and then um, for rural and urban residential. But the supply is declining while the other one is increasing. So supply is declining because of many different things, as Cordy mentioned, because of climate because, and because of the infrastructure that we currently have that's outdated. Um, so to accomplish some of these goals, what we are recommending or what we're pushing is the collaboration. For many years, we've worked in silos. We worked, ag has worked together to find their solutions. Urban, rural, residential has worked with theirs and the environment has worked with theirs. We're saying it's time to collaborate, get out of those silos and work together. And two examples of some of the, those collaborations that are already happening are the San Joaquin Valley Collaborative Action program, which I will call CAP for short for my presentation, and it is something that our institute is deeply involved in and um, helping coordinate. And what this effort is doing is bringing all of these four different areas together to create a shared vision, a shared common problem, and a shared list of solutions. What we want to do is say there isn't a, a ag water problem in the valley, there isn't an environmental water problem, there is a water problem in the San Joaquin Valley, and it is all of us together. Um, I see it as, as a table that has four legs. If any one of those legs is not stable, the entire table isn't stable. And so to me, it's, it's the table that holds the water or is the San Joaquin Valley. If any one of those areas is weak or longer or shorter, we're not in balance. And so we need to collaborate and work together to make sure that those um, things happen and that we are combining our efforts and make shared sacrifices for all of us to move together forward. Another example of it is the San Joaquin Valley Water Blueprint. These two programs work hand in hand. But the um, water blueprint is more focused on infrastructure. So as you saw from a map earlier that Cordy had, there is infrastructure that was built in 1930s, 60s, 70s, but that infrastructure is no longer fitting for our area, for our times. We have a change in climate, we have a bigger population, and the infrastructure needs maintenance. So in addition to some maintenance with the current um, areas that have caused subsidence, we need new canals, Water tends to move from east to west, but we need to move water from west to east, and we will only be able to do that with new canals. We need new water treatments, and then we need, we need new recharge areas that can also serve as habitat restoration and new ecosystems. And then we also need to expand some of our storage facilities and build new ones. It can't be one solution, it has to be a collaborative, all-encompassing camp solution because the problem, as Cordy said, it's a wicked problem um, that we need to, to work on. And so here's some examples of what we suggest for some of those, um, for some of that infrastructure. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we have to have shared sacrifices. We can't just say, I'm not gonna do this because you have to give something up. We all are going to have to do something, all of the, the three or four straws. And then the timeline, as Mike said, things don't happen right away. A, a new dam or an expansion of a dam or a new canal don't happen in two years. And sometimes what happens in it, we go through a drought, there's a problem, so we wanna put money back into that problem and fix the solution. And then it starts raining and everybody forgets that there was a drought and we could have captured some of that water. So we need to start now to build solutions for the future. And in conclusion, I wanna say that um, the infrastructure, as we mentioned, as Cordy mentioned, was built in the 1900s, but the population and gro is growing and changes in climate are affecting that demand for water. There is the economic impact of water reduction that will not only affect agriculture, but all of California. And it will take collaboration and shared sacrifices 
for all of our areas to succeed and for the San Joaquin Valley to succeed. Thank you.